Okay, so now we'll start the presentation part of the meeting. Our presentation um, today is going to be on using FPGAs in homebrew ro robotics. Um, Patrick Lloyd is going to present. And uh, I think there was a couple other people also involved in, in uh, working on the presentation. I know Brandon was involved. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bob Smith. Bob Smith, who's not here tonight. Um, so it's a group effort, but yep. uh, Patrick's going to present, so take it away. All right, thanks. Hi everybody, my name is Patrick Lloyd. Um, so uh, before we get started, uh, if you guys want to follow along on your phones or anything like that, this is the QR code for the slides, um, and that's the uh, the link to it if you have a, a laptop and want to want to type that in. Um, the there's a lot of information in these slides, uh, so I don't plan on covering all of it. There's some embedded links and things like that, so it's uh, there's a lot of stuff to sort of like take and digest on your own. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll try to cover it as, as, as comprehensively as we can. Um, so, all right, we'll wait until the, the, phones, the phones go down and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll start the presentation. basic introduction to using FPGAs in homebrew ro robotics specifically. Um, and this is using a tool that Bob, Brandon, and myself have written called Homebrew Automation. And uh, the first chunk of this, this presentation, there's a lot of information here, um, we're going to go through kind of what an FPGA is, what it isn't, uh, how it works under the hood, why it's good, why it's bad, and then uh, talk about uh, sort of the workflow of using an FPGA, and then how to actually use one for the class that we're looking to get next month. So uh, a lot of this is sort of a teaser talk to try to convince you that, you know, this is really interesting, cool stuff, and it's worth learning um, as part of the, the SIG class uh, in June. So to begin, um, Bob, Brandon, and myself, we, uh, we're tinkerers. Um, They've been in the uh, HBRC for, for a really long time, and we all uh, build stuff in our free time. Uh, we all work at Ologic, and we're all part of this organization called Cluster Fights, where we build distributed systems and battle them against each other. Uh, it's kind of like robot wars, but they're just Raspberry Pis instead. Um, less, less moving parts, less sparks. But um, still a lot of fun. So to start with, what is an FPGA? And I forgot who told me this, uh, someone wise probably, but with a processor, you give it instructions. You tell it what to do. But with an FPGA, there's a philosophical distinction. You tell it what to become. <clears throat> it's short for a field programmable gate array. And this is a class of devices called programmable logic devices. And the idea is you implement digital logic equations on them. It's hardware, it's not software. And there's a couple different ways to implement digital logic. There's combinational, which means you have a collection of ands and ors, nots, nands, things like that. And then sequential logic, so you have flip-flops and latches. Most of them are reprogrammable. Um, they're not super useful if they're only programmable once, so you want to be able to prototype and iterate on things. And uh, sometimes you can save the state in like flash memory. Other times you have to uh, you know, have an external chip to do that. Some other programmable logic devices with really confusing names. I don't know who names these things. There's the programmable array logic, programmable logic arrays, simple programmable logic devices, complex programmable logic devices. Uh, and they are all architecturally different, but they all do similar things. They all implement uh, logic equations. So these are the main people who make FPGAs. You have Xilinx and Intel, they make uh, over 80% of the, the market. Um, they're sort of the big players. And uh, Lattice, Microchip, everybody else, they're, they're kind of catching up in the world. So what's inside an FPGA? A lot of people think it's a special type of processor. And this is you know, a type of processor with you know, an ALU and memory and instructions. It's not that. <laughs> but it, it can be used to implement that. You can make a soft port inside of an FPGA. One would think, 
A field programmable gate array, maybe it's an array of gates. It's not. <laughs> but it can be used to implement arbitrary logic equations like this. So inside of an FPGA is a matrix of interconnected units called configurable logic blocks. And these configurable logic blocks can uh, represent logic equations and then be interconnected to create arbitrarily complex designs. So you have the, the tiny little squares on the outside, those are your input and output pins. The L's are your configurable logic blocks. The C's are the connection matrices. So they route the signals all throughout the device. So the configurable logic block is a lookup table, a flip-flop, and a multiplexer. And sometimes uh, the people that make the FPGAs will have more inputs on their lookup tables, or they'll have uh, you know, more complex configurable logic blocks. But in its core, this is what makes up the, the bread and butter of an FPGA. So something that is really awesome in recent years is that in the entire history of FPGAs, the almost half a century that they've been around, there has never been an open source tool chain to go from start to finish getting code, getting your Verilog from you know, your text editor into your FPGA until now. And people are doing all sorts of crazy things with them. There's this really interesting resurgence in open source silicon and uh, open source FPGA design. So people are doing things like uh, the open source architecture RISC-V. People are doing like retro gaming uh, with the Mister, but they're actually recreating <coughs> chips that have been out of production for decades. And they're actually like implementing those on FPGAs and playing retro games with them and stuff. Uh, they can also be used for software-defined radio, audio synthesizers, uh, cryptography, video encoding and decoding, all sorts of crazy stuff. And in general, FPGAs can be leveraged for things that require really high memory bandwidth and massive parallelization. So they do really well with fine-grained parallelization, which is different from, say, like a GPU, uh, which is often a question you get, like, what's the difference between an FPGA and a GPU? Uh, a GPU is meant for doing uh, like single instructions on multiple data, or SIMD. And FPGAs are good for doing uh, you know, very fine-grained, low-level uh, operations on data. So there's got to be downsides. So this is Dave Jones. And if you have ever seen any like EEV blog uh, videos, oh, he's, yeah. he's a crotchety old engineer. But what he's really good at is exposing, uh, you know, what are the what are the risk factors involved in particular, you know, design decisions that you make? Like, what are uh, things you need to consider if you're going to go forward with these sorts of designs? So he talks about uh, they can be expensive, they can be high power, uh, FPGAs are complex to implement, and you know there are a lot of gotchas that you have to worry about. But uh, they, excuse me. <clears throat> Uh, they're also uh, not good at doing super, super complex things. You don't want to try to like implement a, uh, an entire like, you know, Ethernet stack with them or uh, do like really, really complicated things. They're, they're really good for like operating at the very, very low level hardware. And certain problems like Conway's Game of Life, they, uh, those aren't easily parallelized. So you probably want to use a processor for those things anyway. So why would you want to use one in a robot? You have access to tons of reconfigurable I.O. So you have hundreds of pins. They can be UARTs. They can be changed. Those same pins can be changed to be uh, a SPI bus or an ice grid C bus. And they don't require uh, any change of your FPGA board itself. So those can, things can be swapped and re-implemented internally. They're also really good for doing timers and counters. So you can do motor control, you can do sonar, encoders, uh, IR remotes, and they're easily scalable to a whole bunch of devices. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you needed five separate I2C buses, but on an FPGA, it's trivial to implement that. You can also use them for 
PID controllers. Uh, they're very fast, they're glitch free, and they're good for doing like fixed point operations very, very quickly. Uh, they also lend themselves to doing finite state machines. So Brandon was uh, interested in actually implementing a line follower and the obstacle avoidance robot in the FPGA exclusively, without any, any help from Linux. Um, so it is possible to uh, set up basic robotic behaviors and have those uh, implemented in the hardware itself. So this part is a little bit uh, a little bit dense in information, but the key takeaway of this workflow is that all of these tools are downloadable, they are extensible, you can change them to suit your particular device, and they're getting better all the time. So you have uh, Verilog and VHDL as your two main languages that you're coding your device in, uh, describing your circuits with, and simulating it to make sure that your uh, design works before you actually go out and buy the super expensive hardware. Um, and this is kind of what a simulation looks like. You're testing all the inputs and outputs. There's synthesis, which is converting your Verilog into uh, ands and ors, and uh, into something that can then be optimized and put onto the device. Mapping those ands and ors to the configurable logic block inside your FPGA. And then placement and routing. So it's taking these designs and then squeezing them into the, uh, the actual fabric of the FPGA so that you can uh, you know, connect it to your individual uh, IO pins. And what's really cool is these tools have been reverse engineered, or sorry, the, uh, these tools use reverse engineered um, architectures. Sorry. These tools work on FPGAs that have been reverse engineered. That's what I'm trying to say. These uh, people have taken FPGAs, they've decapped them, they've run uh, uh, like statistical analysis on all these files that the, the vendor tools generate, and they're able to reverse engineer what is happening under the hood of all of these FPGAs. And uh, this particular uh, image of the place and router, it shows the, uh, the different lookup tables, it shows the routing networks, and it shows all the, the interconnects between them. Um, so that's pretty cool that like this hasn't gotten any help from the actual people who make the FPGAs themselves. It's just people in the community who have like, you know, been itching for this stuff and have pulled these things apart and were able to like build tools like this. So I, I'm super impressed with that. Uh, bitmap, this is the, the binary file that gets loaded onto your device. And then it has to get flashed. So generally you use JTAG or SPY and then that'll be uh, put onto the, the memory, either on the FPGA itself or an external chip. All right, we're done, right? No. <laughs> we want to write less Verilog. Verilog and FPGA designs in general can get really unruly, and they don't lend themselves well to design reuse, which is something that, you know, when writing software, you want to try to maximize as much as possible. So. Uh, the vendors who make FPGAs and also people in the community have tried to figure out ways to optimize this process of designing hardware. And uh, MATLAB, uh, Xilinx with their uh, Vivado HLS lets you write in C. Uh, some of these tools they let you write in Python and all these things will generate Verilog. Other times you'll be given these big black boxes where you type in some parameters and it'll spit you out a you know, some sort of block that you can drop into your design and, you know, you cross your fingers and you hope it works. Or, you can connect your FPGA to a Linux computer and you can leverage the strengths of both of them. And that's what homebrew automation is about. So, the idea here is to connect a tiny FPGA, which is an ICE40 made by Lattice, to a Raspberry Pi. And write small modular peripherals that connect to a simple bus network. And 
what this allows you to do is provide a layer of abstraction. So for folks that haven't had a lot of exposure to FPGAs and writing them, you don't have to learn the entire complex network of getting stuff from your, you know, say your GPS all the way up into your uh, into Linux so that you can pipe it into ROS. <coughs> you just have to write these simple peripheral drivers. So the uh, homebrew automation has certain uh, peripheral blocks. So you have UARTs, you have GPIOs, there's things like timers and counters, and all of these can communicate with each other to allow them to uh, provide higher levels of abstraction to your Linux side. And on the Linux side, there's a couple of few basic commands, and you can get values, set values, and you can open up streams with cat. Um, you can list certain properties of them and, and load in certain, uh, load in your plugins. And what's valuable about this is all of the Linux development happens on, uh, happens in user space. So you can write these without having to recompile a kernel, and you can talk to, talk to hardware um, without a lot of the complexity of really low level Linux development. Um, which is a big time saver in, uh, in doing Linux work. So this is just an example of connecting this to a motor controller. You have a couple of different uh, parameters, <coughs> like mode, speed, direction, and this is how you get it to run from Linux. You open up a bash shell and you say, motors, go into brake mode, set the speed to 50%, set the direction, and go forward. So. Uh, this allows you to, you know, write simple bash scripts that can uh, pipe data back and forth to other scripts, and uh, makes the whole development process a lot easier. So the hardware side of it is based off of a Raspberry Pi 3, a tiny FPGA BX, and a lot of Pololu uh, uh, parts, specifically the Romy platform. And the reason we're going with Romy is because it's a very complete kit. Um, part of the class that we're trying to give is not about uh, building the robot and debugging breadboards and all this kind of stuff. We want this to be, you know, plug and play with the hardware as much as possible, and then focus just on teaching Verilog and uh, getting a robot up and running to do like a line fall. <coughs> so this is the tiny FPGA. This is the uh, the Romy kit, and we have some at the front table if you guys want to check those out. And then this is a custom board that is just providing an interconnect between all the sensors and the Romy board. And then the class itself is going to be next month. Uh, it's going to be Wednesday, June nineteenth, at the Hacker Dojo. And uh, if you know, it's probably going to be around two hundred dollars. Um, but if the materials end up being less than that, you know, we'll we'll definitely refund that because we're we're not looking to you know make any money off of this. Um, so, if you guys have any questions, or you guys want links to the slides or anything like that, um, let me know. The price includes the robots? Yeah. So you mentioned that the, the Linux environment uh, controls the, writes code for the FPGA, or spits out code for the FPGA, or it's sort of behind the scenes, or? So, it provides a, so we provide a framework. So, um, there's a, uh, a few Verilog files that are already written, and then the goal of the class would be to write small, simple, um, you know, Verilog files that then kind of plug into this code that's already been written. And plugging into that thing is, uh, it's all the, uh, the bus network and communication between the FPGA and the Raspberry Pi itself. So this is, uh, it's a class to teach uh, Verilog talking specifically to sensors. I guess this homebrew automation thing, yeah. that's like a... It's like an app or something or a tool you guys built? Uh, it's just what we've been calling the collection of tools that we use to, uh, you know, connect sensors through a bus to a Raspberry Pi. So just it's it's a collection of uh, C files for the Raspberry Pi and a couple of Verilog files for the, the FPGA side. And all of this stuff is on uh, our GitHub. So if you guys wanted to kind of dig into that and, uh, you know, see what the actual architecture is like, um, 
all that is available if you guys want to freeze it. So. Uh, so say I want to come to class and learn how to like read an encoder. Would that be possible? Yeah, absolutely. Tick, 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 tick. Yep. So no. Yeah. So part of this would be um, we would probably write a driver that showed how to take the the uh, you know the inputs from a uh, from an encoder and you know generate an output that is then you know sent up to uh, to Linux. So we'd be we'd be learning that as part of the class. So you could add modules to this. Yep. Thing. Yeah, absolutely. On the tiny whatever it is. How much stuff do you? Need? So that is uh, that depends how you write your code, um, but we're designing it so that you can have up to sixteen peripherals. Um, so 16 different types of sensors. Yep. Uh, you saying like bus? Are you uh, is that like an internal to the FPGA that goes out to the pie, or are you talking about like connecting multiple FPGAs together? Uh, so this is internal to the FPGA. Um, it is how uh, it's basically saying all of the different uh, peripherals that you have in your device they're they're ORed together and when you want to read or write data from them, one of the devices uh, takes control of that and says, all right, nobody is allowed to talk on this, this shared you know, communication channel um, until you know, the one that took control of it is done. Is that something you develop yourself, or is it based on something AMBA? Or? So this is based off of uh, some of the uh, demand peripherals work that uh, Bob Smith did, right. and also work that um, Brandon <laughs> built to Kind of implement the the FPGA side of it, and uh, he's going to be available after the uh, after the talk, and we can we can all talk about the uh, uh, some of like the the low level how the actual like FPGA internal structure works. Um, yes. What's the protocol between the FPGA and the Raspberry Pi? It talks uh, serial, so it's just a, a regular UART uh, oh. talking at like 115k baud. Yes, sir. I'm not sure how much I want to give away, but can you talk a little bit about the, the tool chain you're going to use and whether it's all open source, or if you can't talk about that, can you talk about some that you've tried that didn't work? Yeah, so the, the tool chain that we're going to use um, is entirely open source, um, and there's a couple different parts and pieces that uh, connect together. So uh, there's, uh, most of it is done through a tool called Yosis, and Yosis has uh, it has synthesis and technology mapping uh, built into it. So that means it can take your take your Verilog and spit it out into something that either a uh, a Xilinx tool or this uh, this tool called Next PNR can use to actually place and route and generate the bitstream for your design. A quick follow up too. Yeah. It sounds like you're using the regular UART device driver in Linux. You aren't building special device drivers to talk to this hardware. Yes, that is correct. All right. Oh, yes. One of the advantages of uh, an FPGA would be being able to run many things in parallel, multi-threaded, uh, hard real time. Is that is that possible with the 16 peripherals? They can run hard real time? So with 16 peripherals, you can potentially run into a situation where uh, a lot of devices are trying to talk at the same time and you end up with uh, you know, some devices hogging the bus versus others. So while you can do hard real time uh, with FPGAs, that specifically is not going to be the focus of the class. Um, but it is definitely, uh, it's not a uh, necessarily a difficult thing to do. So. Like if, if you have uh, just motor controllers or you're just reading encoders, um, you're probably not going to be limited by the bandwidth of the, uh, the internal bus. Can I just oh yeah, yeah, Brandon. So in general, you, since, since the, the peripherals can kind of be independent and running in parallel, as you said, so for example, you can you know, set up like a state machine. A state machine, or, or even like uh, you know, a PI or a speed controller, for example, that's reading the encoder ticks and like uh, you know, generating the PWM for, for the motor, and it's just focusing on that, and it doesn't have to worry about what anybody else is doing. So, you, you know, the higher level processor could 
come and say, okay, s you know, set your speed to this, and it's just going to sit and do that until it's told to do something different. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the, the the peripherals all can act independently. Uh, the only place where you might have um, issues is the speed of being able to communicate data back, you know, to the Raspberry Pi. Um, but uh, but in general, I don't I don't think that's going to be a problem because the Raspberry Pi is more focused on the algorithms and higher level stuff in the non real time uh, control where the, the FPJ can handle all the uh, real time stuff of uh, capturing you know data from the sensors and controlling the motors and, and the encoders. Uh, Bye. Uh, so it'll probably be, um, I don't know, ar around two hours, and that'll be probably around the time that, you know, everyone's getting antsy and, you know, uh, hard to stay focused. Um, this is likely going to take several classes um, over, you know, a couple of months to, you know, actually uh, you know, implement, but we're going to focus the, the first class on, you know, teaching the fundamentals of Verilog and, you know, uh, integrating these into the system. Is there a master clock, or do we need a master clock to, uh, if you're running so many things in parallel? So the, the tiny FPGA has an oscillator on it that runs at about 20 megahertz, I believe. I think that's going to be used. Uh, it's going to go into likely a phase lock loop inside the FPGA itself, and then that'll be used to generate like a master clock to kind of keep everything in, in sync. Are you going to post the link to register for the class? Uh, so, uh, when setting up uh, classes and stuff at the Hacker Dojo, uh, they have kind of an event system, and that'll generate like a link, uh, kind of like a meetup group. And I'll give that link to Osman, and uh, that'll get posted to the uh, the HBRC mailing list. So you can RSVP, RSVP through that. What's the capacity of the group? Um, I think, I mean, depending on. Uh, which room we end up going with, uh, it could be anywhere between like 20 to 80. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. yeah. So another uh, like question on the class, if, uh, we already have some of like the parts and everything, do we need to like still pay you guys or do we just use our... No, if, if you have the stuff, um, and like that's uh, why in this slide, uh, there's links to all this. If you want to buy it up uh, in advance and just bring it to the class, you're more than welcome to. Um, or, you know, we can buy this and, and provide it to you. Um, <clears throat> it's a thought. You're, it sounds like you're going to try to um, cover Verilog in this. In this. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be more interesting to get to one of the higher level languages that you put out there? In or whatever? So, part of... Uh, <coughs> Learning the FPGAs is to learn some of the fundamentals and uh, learning, I guess, how to actually, you know, uh, write and describe hardware. Um, and that's that's something that we want to try to teach with these tools. Um, learning uh, MyGen or the, the transpilers, any of those things, um, those are other strategies to, you know, you can accomplish similar things with them. Um, but that's not something that we're going to be focusing on for the class. I, I guess my point is, that, that it's not going to be, you're not going to get anything done if, if you teach anybody anything in Verilog and throughout. That's not going to be enough. And so that's, that's what I'm trying to do. If you want to go um, show the whole tool chain, maybe you'll just give everybody a Verilog program, but that's that's about it. Yeah, I mean, so you're going to have like modules where you just kind of slice in a little piece of the right, Verilog. Right. Yeah. It might have you create like templates where you just put in the last oh, bit, or some yeah, last chunks, guys. maybe that might help. At least you're not doing it in a VHDL. Yeah, so the, the yeah. way that we've... Um, the way that we've kind of uh, started designing this class is uh, there's going to be kind of like a Verilog tutorial showing like, all right, this is how you like blink an LED. This is how you uh, connect a switch to an LED. These are some of the, the fundamentals, the hello world of um, you know, writing HDL, writing Verilog. Um, and then once we kind of get to a certain point, it'll be like, all right, here's 
the entire like homebrew automation uh, stack, and this is what you do to implement a uh, you know a GPIO controller, and then you work through the, just that tiny part. So the the whole homebrew automation is to sort of hide the complexity and uh, accelerate the process of building a robot using an FPGA. What percentage yeah. of the resources on the FPGA, FPGA do you anticipate using, given that uh, five slave two master design that you presented? Um, I'm not totally sure of the, the resource consumption on that. Uh, do you know what that was looking like so far? Um, so, w w yeah, so we, we only have a couple peripherals um, right now. Uh, and so, I don't know, right now it's maybe we're only at like like 10 to 20 percent um, so I th I think like our end goal is basically to have like a robot that can kind of do like phase two of the table bot challenge and that's kind of the level that we're looking at like getting to um, and I think that will fit on on this FPJ all right um, Wayne I'm just interested in how many people are interested in showing up in the class. I know I am. I, the reason why we're giving this talk is because cool. people ask for it. So you can count noses here, and you know it's. Uh, <coughs> okay. And, and we'll probably have people send their money through HBRC so that they can handle all the, the, the money stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. I haven't talked that over with Osman. Is yeah, that okay? That's fine. Okay. So. Um, and you know, so that that would be kind of how it would work structurally, and then we we probably need to have a deadline for when people sign up for the class so that you have time to order the parts and bring bring them in. Okay. Um, yeah, and that'll that'll all take place. All communication for that stuff will take place on the mailing list. Mm -hmm. Yes. So did I understand this will be a series of two-hour classes? Mm -hmm. Yes. About how many? Um, we're not sure. Um, I guess it, it sort of depends on how much how much we get through in the first one, and that'll kind of like set the pace for for the ones after that. Uh, roughly dozen. Mm, I'd probably say uh, maybe like I don't know three or four. I think they're monthly. Or? I think monthly, yeah. Yes. So how did the cluster fight guys get into robotics? Uh. You know, uh, just kind of, uh, just kind of ended up that way. You know, um, so uh, I guess a lot of my friends are, are in the, the cluster fights, and uh, you know, just sort of, I was started talking about it at work, and we had more uh, more folks from a lot to kind of join the join the group. Because I pulled Constantine over here for the, the seven pi cluster. Here. Yeah, yeah. I've been I've been waiting to see him compete. All right. Um, well, are there any more questions? All right.